So, in trying to think about what to say today uh, in this talk and, and being cognizant that we are also celebrating uh, MLK Day, I thought I would try to, to join two themes of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. One is um, uh, his, uh, his example of his life being one of uh, being um, excellent in terms of his academic preparation and being in the right place at the right time to launch uh, a career that has obviously been highly impactful. And I think there are lots of lessons that we can learn in healthcare from that notion of luck meets preparation. And then the second uh, part of the talk, I thought actually what I want would like to do is to pick up on one of the things that Dr. King, of course, was very concerned about is that inequalities in health care and talking specifically about um, inequalities in uh, care at the end of life and how we as health care providers might try to do something about that. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I, I, I titled this Be Good Enough to Be Lucky and that kind of refers to the first half of the talk. But uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes. And this is multimedia. And so I'm a little nervous that we, we get that right too. But let's see. Now, <laughs> I live on a golf course. I'm a frustrated golfer. The thing about golf is that it's such a, a beautifully deceptive game. Uh, I, it, for those of you who don't play golf, if you happen to just look, watch on some of the tournaments on TV, it's totally deceiving because the pros just make it look so easy the way they hit the ball. But I've always been fascinated with uh, Tiger Woods uh, and his skill as a golfer. And uh, I was watching a couple of tournaments with my son, and a few thoughts came to mind. Uh, and I thought I would uh, show you some of uh, his thoughts as to introduce this topic. So let's see if, uh, if this works. Okay, so here's Tiger Woods uh, playing golf on a famous course in Florida, Sawgrass. Uh, course is this is island green it's a very famous uh, a hole and uh, his ball is on the green and he's about to make a putt so let's see if this he works turns hard to the right what does this do Gary it goes sort of a little bit over that way and then comes right back correct but but Johnny it goes so much to the right as it comes down that hill that oh. that's where the players have been fooled I mean you've got to be three four feet out to the left of the hole as it comes over the ridge and most guys have just not seen that. He almost needs to pretend, Gary, it looks to me like like the hole is up on the top of the ridge. As you said, four, five, maybe six feet left of the hole to try and just barely roll it past there. Almost forget about where Steve Williams is standing down there next to the cup. Like what he's doing there, just swinging the butter, visualizing <coughs> trying to track the line that he wants. <coughs> I know there are probably some golfers in the room, but when I saw that, I said, my thought was, nobody's that good. <laughs> nobody's that good. How could, how could he have gotten that ball in the hole? Let's see if, yeah. So, keep that mental image. And let's see if we just take a look at one more shot of Tigers. This is the ball of Tiger Woods. Lenny, what about this? Pardon, this is extremely difficult. This one of the toughest pitches on the entire place here. He's got to put this well that you can see him looking up the slope. He's almost got to put it up to where you saw Trevor Emelman's ball come from to get it close. Well, I'm reminded of Davis Love here four or five years ago when he pitched in 
Yeah, he's a little bit further up, I think, than mm -hmm. Davis was. Yes, he is. Got the same basic kind of shot. He's going to have to, to get it close. He's going to have to put it up into the slope, though, somewhat. And, of course, it's made a lot tougher by having that second cut right behind the ball. This is at the famous Masters tournament in, in 2005. Put it back and have to hit a low shot. He cannot put it up in the air with the, with the second cut that close behind the ball. You can see him putting it back in his stance right here and picking the club up like he's going to hit right down on it. And uh, he's picked out a landing spot that is a good 25 feet above the hole. There's a good chance he doesn't get this inside the mark of the ball. Also a perfect uh, commercial for Nike too, right? In your life have you seen anything like that? So, again, nobody's that good, right? You see these, these seasoned golf announcers saying, you know, there's he can't get the ball within 10 feet of the hole. He, he actually not only does that, he actually makes the shot. So the question is, is that, was really, was he that good or was he just that lucky? And it's, it's clear that it's a little bit of both, right? That you have to be good enough to get it close. And if you're good enough to get it close, sometimes it's gonna go in the hole. And I think that was, I had an aha moment, you know, as I was watching that, and I, my son was sitting there with me. I said, see, you gotta be good enough to get it close, and it'll get in the hole. And, and then I said, you know, I had just read this thing to, about how uh, Tiger's uh, practice routine, and I told my son, you know, he hits like a thousand balls a day. You know, he's got this tremendous routine. So, so this, is, this is, in my view, a nice example of how luck meets preparation. Now, there's another famous golfer, um, Gary Player, uh, who played in the, my father's generation, who, who famously said, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. Okay, so this notion of uh, being lucky is a little more than that, that luck does, as, uh, as Louis Pasteur said, favor the prepared mind or favor the prepared. So, you know, there, there, this is this interesting issue, I think, as we go through life and our professional development uh, as in terms of, of, of how we see our career trajectories, what do we, uh, how can we plot our success and I think we plot our success by being focused on what it is we want to accomplish being as excellently prepared as possible and then trying to take advantage of the lucky breaks we get in life uh, you know poker has as uh, portrayed here in Cezanne's famous pony uh, painting on in the bottom you know poker is a game of luck and skill actually Mark Twain once served on a jury in uh, in, uh, in Ohio and they were deciding a case and uh, Mark Twain convinced the jurors and the judge that uh, that they needed to decide that this particular case based on the fact that um, what happened was based not on just kind of a blind random circumstance but on uh, a, a combination of circumstance and 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 motivation and they used actually studies of skilled poker players to prove that although poker is somewhat luck if you if you play a lot and if you prepare yourself you're actually much more likely to win than if you are a novice but there's luck and there's blind luck right so I say blind luck is finding the lottery ticket on the street right but luck you actually 
Yeah, sure. Of course, you're lucky if you win a $200 million Powerball, but at least you have to buy a ticket. Right. So that's luck. But blind luck is kind of is is finding the lottery ticket, the winning lottery ticket on the street. And I'm not talking about blind luck. I'm talking about preparing yourself to be lucky by at least buying the lottery ticket. So what examples do we have in medicine and science that luck has played a role in great um, advances and actually there are many 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 uh, the discovery of, uh, of of vulcanization uh, of rubber the uh, discovery of Teflon of velcro uh, microwaves all of those things actually happen by um, uh, as a result of an initial kind of lucky observation and then the a scientist in gay involved were able to follow up on the lucky observation. Of course, one of the most famous examples in the, in the realm of medicine, and I'm just going to show two or three examples which have actually won, it's been so significant they, they won Nobel Prizes. One of the most famous example is, of course, Alexander Fleming's discovery of, the, of uh, penicillin. Uh, he, uh, of course, discovered that uh, this some serendipitously when he left uh, a petri dish out uh, and uh, went on vacation and came back and noted that uh, it, the petri dish was uncovered and noticed that there was a clear area around the area where bacteria should have been growing and followed up and 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 uh, and actually elucidated the fact that this clear area was, was caused by the uh, mold on the plate that excreted uh, uh, penicillin that killed the bacteria. Now interestingly enough, and this is another point I want to make here, um, and this, was, this happened in about ninth, the mid-19th century, and I think uh, uh, Fleming was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1955 or so, but actually in the early 1900s, a veterinarian doctor in London uh, is on record as having cautioned his students in the laboratories that they were doing was to always cover your petri dishes. Because if you don't cover your petri dishes, something will fall into the petri dish and destroy your experiment. Now, that veterinarian was never smart enough didn't have enough, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, experience or formal education to follow up on this observation, but he actually made the same observation that Fleming made 50 years prior to Fleming. But, he, but we honor Fleming with the Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, also, it is true that uh, a few years before Fleming made this observation, uh, he had um, uh, a cold and he had actually coughed into a petri dish and there was bacteria growing in a petri dish and uh, he was observing this one day and he was actually uh, was also tearful and a teardrop fell into the petri dish. Now, this was years before his discovery of penicillin. Teardrop fell into the petri dish and he noticed several days later that there was a uh, clear area around the bacteria. He actually went on to isolate this and, and actually isolated an enzyme, lysozyme, that w it wasn't an antibiotic, it was an enzyme that was excreted from his teardrop that was responsible for that phenomenon on the petri plate. So when he made this observation about the penicillin mole, four or five years later, he had that in mind that, yes, there is this, I, this notion that something will excrete out from a something dropped on a petri dish, and that might be important. So luck, meeting, preparation. The first Nobel Prize ever given was given to uh, William Röntgen for discovery of x-rays. Now, of course, he was experimenting with, with cathode ray tubes, and he noticed that uh, uh, cathode ray that, that uh, there was a, a darkening of some photographic plates 
around the cathode ray, went on to further investigate and, and, and realize it was a new form of radiation, which he called X-ray. Well, guess what? Someone had made the same observation three or four years ago, but never understood enough to follow up. So here again, and, and, and by the way, he, that his, his uh, Röntgen's op uh, observation was totally serendipitous in the sense that he wasn't planning an experiment. He had just happened to see some photographic plates that he left out near cathode ray tube, which produced uh, this, which showed evidence of this new uh, form of radiation. And and then there's the example of Banting and Best and insulin and the discovery of insulin. Uh, Best was actually a medical student. <laughs> so there's hope, right? <laughs> uh, Banting was a surgeon, but they were not the first people to make an observation uh, that was a seminal observation in the discovery of insulin as a hormone. Um, uh, many years before, for this, a veterinarian had noticed that dogs which were thirsty and which had this syndrome that they called diabetes, uh, that they noticed that when these dogs were in the field and, and urinated on the field, that flies tend to congregate around their urine, <laughs> attracted to something in the urine. And they then realized, others realized that this was uh, uh, sugar that they were attracted to. There were other scientists who made observations that there was something in the pancreas that seemed to affect um, sugar metabolism in these dogs and in fact extracted uh, um, materials from the pancreas, injected it into diabetic dogs and they seemed to get better. But they were so unsure about what they had discovered that they actually wrote it up sent it to uh, a journal, but with the instruction that they not publish this or open this up for, uh, until someone else could verify it. And because they said, we just don't understand why this is happening. Well, along comes Banting and Best, and Banting has the confidence of a surgeon <laughs> and the self-assurance of a surgeon. He makes essentially the same discovery, publishes immediately, and wins the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so it is a prepared mind following lucky observation, but it's a flexible mind. It's a mind that is um, willing to think through options and, uh, and, and potential hypotheses about how this observation, what this observation means. The example of Banting and Besser, persistence, they, have, they were said to essentially stay up days at a time trying to, um, to extract insulin from pancreatic abstracts and were famous for not you know, getting an hour of sleep through, uh, you know, every two or three days. And, and it is also having confidence in, in one's powers of observation, all of which are, are very important in terms of discovery. And I think we should all be mindful of this and keep this in mind. Of course, Louis Pasteur famously said, in the field of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. But insightful luck is often at play, and, but it also takes hard work, preparation, being in the right company, reading the right literature, going to the right meetings, associating yourself with people smarter than you. I think these are all very important ingredients that actually allow us to take advantage of the luck, lucky fortune to which we are played. There's another uh, aspect of this too in terms of building a success in a career and this was stated to me by uh, a woman I greatly admire, Dr. Shirley Jackson. Dr. Jackson is a nuclear physicist. She uh, got a PhD from MIT in, in the 1960s. I think she was the first African-American woman to get a PhD in nuclear physics from MIT. Uh, went on to uh, be appointed as chair of the U.S. Uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, under uh, President uh, Bill Clinton and, and is now president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I actually had dinner with her one night 
we're talking about what how one builds a successful career. And she, this, her comment to me, in which she's subsequently written about, is personal motivation. One cannot under, underestimate the importance of that, but the fundamental thing is to have focus, to have an early success, because early success creates the confidence to move on. I think confidence is a huge issue. Confidence in terms of, of, of uh, having um, understanding what you're observing and conveying and communicating with what you're observing to the world. It's interesting too that this sentiment is almost the identical sentiment that uh, was ex expressed by Dr. Craig Vetner, of course the famous um, molecular biologist who uh, helped mapped the human genome. He said essentially the same thing. His success in science was fueled by the fact that he had a lot of early successes which gave him the confidence to move on. So, very important. What does this have to do with Martin Luther King? Well, a uh, little known fact is that Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King was not the first choice to lead the civil rights um, movement and the civil rights project in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. In fact, uh, at the time that uh, Rosa Parks, seen in this photograph, uh, refused to sit down on the, uh, uh, refused to stand up <laughs> on the Montgomery bus, Martin Luther King, I think, had been in Montgomery for uh, less than a year. Um, he uh, but there was, there was a problem with the pastoral leadership in Montgomery, Alabama at that time, particularly in the African American community. There was a lot of turf wars. There was uh, whose church is bigger than my church and who should lead this, blah, blah, blah. And so as a compromise, uh, uh, actually Dr. King's parishioner, uh, Mr. Nixon, suggested that, well, why don't you, my, why don't you I asked my pastor to lead this protest. He just got here. He seems to be a smart fellow. He's young, and he doesn't have any of these turf or, ter or territory uh, issues. Now, of course, there sits Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, a valedictorian of Crozier Theological Seminary, um, a PhD in uh, theology from Boston University, um, skillful orator, rhetorician. I mean, there could be no one better to lead this, but he was not by any means the first choice. And actually, I show here the Holt Street Baptist Church, which is where he made his famous speech uh, on the night of, uh, uh, in December of 1955. Uh, which which really kicked off the Montgomery boy boycott, but that was not his church. That was the church of another pastor. Dr. King's church was so small that there was no way that they could actually hold the meeting there. And of course, it's now a national landmark, and I think a real irony, right, that the, the national landmark is marked by a Confederate flag. So interesting. But. So I think his starting his career is this example of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, and uh, actually earlier he had been asked to um, um, assume a leadership position in a, um, in a uh, community project and had basically decided that he couldn't do it because he just arrived in town, had a new baby, and um, and, uh, and really was reluctant to assume leadership initially in the Montgomery bus boycott. So it's a really an interesting uh, story as to how this kind of fell into his lap and then of course he was a magnificent leader. Now in terms of me, this is actually a picture of me in my high school <laughs> chemistry class <laughs> more years ago than I want to admit. Uh, um, but my luck uh, came as someone who was quite interested in science, uh, doing well in chemistry. And one day my chemistry teacher, Mr. Thompson, came to me and said, oh, there is this uh, program funded by the National Science Foundation and I'm selecting you to go to this program during the summer between junior and senior year high school to study 
advanced biochemistry. So here I'm on the roof with my <laughs> with my fellow students and uh, the Loomis Chafee School in Hartford, Connecticut, studying advanced biochemistry. But it was that experience which gave me the confidence to uh, know that I could compete with some really smart folks. Uh, there's uh, this woman here had been a Westinghouse scholar in New York City. She's one of the most brilliant mathematicians I'd ever seen. And here was little Rich Payne from this high school in Elizabeth, New Jersey, being able to at least hold his own in the classroom with a Westinghouse uh, scholar. And uh, I then went on, uh, that kind of cemented my sense that, uh, yeah, I could go to, I could do this medical school thing. And I went on to medical school and I guess, John, they say the rest is history. <laughs> okay, so I did want to really um, emphasize this, that I think everyone's career um, is really marked by these periods of, of, being, of being in the right place at the right time if you can take advantage of it. And the advantage is being really prepared. <laughs> to uh, step up to the plate and to assume uh, and to take advantage of the opportunity. Um, and that um, in the realm of science, um, there are, it, it is, it's so interesting to me that people who, that there are these serendipitous observations that some people take advantage of and others are not able to take advantage of it. And again, I think the people who, who are, can take advantage of, of their opportunities are prepared and confident and, uh, and have flexibility in how they think about uh, their, uh, these, their observations they're making.